great piano player in the 70s, who in the room has heard of Keith Green, the name? So part of the Jesus movement, I guess, if you will, um, part of the Jesus people, hippie movement. Uh, he was a jingle writer and a great piano player, and he wrote jingles for commercials, and, uh, and he was quite good at it because he, he just had this way of playing on the piano and singing a looped thing that just worked really well in the marketing industry, it turned out. That's not what he wanted to do with his life. He ended up writing a lot of worship so, uh, albums and, uh, and performed live in worship. But uh, one of his most famous songs was titled The Sheep and the Goats. And in that song, Keith Green basically recants the entire parable of the sheep and the goats all while playing the piano. So while he's talking about the sheep, there's a happy little looping, a very lighthearted kind of springy feeling, uh, you know, uh, thing while he's talking about the sheep. And then when he transitions to talk about the goats, it becomes ominous and dark. And he really hangs out there in that ominous space for a while on the keyboard, bringing you, you know, mentally where the story is taking you as well. And for the most part, he recants the parable, but at the end, he does interject one line of his own. And that is an observation that he makes very dramatically, that he says that the main difference between the sheep and the goats is what they did and did not do. Well, this morning, I love Keith. We're going to maybe take a chance at disagreeing. Uh, with Keith Green. He's not here to defend himself, unfortunately, but he is in, he is in the presence of the answer right now that we don't have. Um, so sheep do the right thing. They do the good thing, right? And the, and the goats, I'm or on the wrong side. I think the sheep are on the right, whatever. The goats don't do the right thing. They don't do the good thing, right? This is, if you Google, what does the Bible mean by sheep and goats? This is what comes up as the first option. It's isolated at the top very succinctly in paragraph form for you, so you don't even have to question the source. It's just Google knows the answer to this question. This, this is what Google's answer is to what does the Bible mean? This week, it may change next week, who knows, but um, the term refers to Jesus's prophecy in the New Testament, Matthew 25, 20, uh, 32, that the sheep, that is the compassionate, will sit on the right hand and find salvation, and the goats, the hard-hearted, will sit on the left and be sent to damnation. In the words of uh, the early 2000s band Cake, if there's anybody that is a fan in here, Sheeps, sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. That's the basic interpretation here, right? And I suspect that this parable has less to do with what the sheep did and didn't do and it has more to do with how or why they did or did not do it. So let's read the parable, take a look for ourselves, and we'll explore it a little bit. Let's pray first. Father, I thank you for, for the sanctuary. I thank you for everyone that's here, everyone that's watching online, everyone that watches later, the people who call themselves or a part of the sanctuary are important to me, and uh, we're important to one another, and we love you, and we, we love getting together to celebrate you together. Lord, meet us here today. Help us to see your heart, God. I pray that you could help us even to put aside intellectualism and overthought and sit with your holy heart for a moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, when the Son of Man, this is Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed, by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared before you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. 
Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, uh, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or, or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you do not do it, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteousness into eternal life. I think it's important to note that the sheep are unaware that they're doing what they're credited with doing. We've been commonly taught that the goats just simply refuse to do it. I suspect that the goats are unaware of it. I suspect that the goats are unaware of the good thing or the right thing. I've met some that are aware of it and just refuse to do it, but I suspect also that there are goats that are unaware. Sheep follow the voice of the shepherd. I don't know if you've ever seen videos of that. I didn't dig one up again to rehash, but it's an interesting thing to watch that as the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd, they will move with the shepherd from pasture to pasture, place to place. The shepherd can call them in. Has anyone here ever taken care of a goat? They are wretched creatures, in my opinion. The worst, I think, animal that there is to take care of. Pigs are bad, but goats are worse. They're very difficult to get to do something. Uh, there are a couple easy ways you can get them to do something, but asking them or telling them is not one of them. Um, goats basically do not hear the voice of the shepherd, or if they hear it, they don't pay any attention to it. They do not listen. They follow their stomachs quite well. If you're taking care of a goat and it is time for the goat to eat, good luck. You have to get in there and that thing is gonna maul you uh, because it, it wants to eat when it wants to eat. They also follow their curiosity quite well. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. Let's take a deeper look at this parable by moving further out from the parable. We're gonna look at an image that should be familiar to most of you here. And I want you to remember the timeline that Peter has used. And the main thing that I, I need you to see in this is that we are traveling on that linear timeline. That's our space time. But we're surrounded by God who is all over and all around that timeline, all in and all throughout that timeline. You and I technically only ever have the present moment in which we find ourselves. As soon as you notice it, it isn't here anymore, right? We can try, let's plan. Let's think about, there's an upcoming moment, we're all gonna take notice of it, there it is, and now it is gone, right? That was it, that you, it's done, that, we can do it again. Here it comes, there it is, now it's gone. They're very quick, they're very quick. Um, you can't show up at a graduation party last week that you missed. You can't do it, it's done now, it's over. You can't show up somewhere next Tuesday. You can plan to show up somewhere next Tuesday, but you can't show up there. God was at the graduation party last week that you missed. He was also wherever you were, and he is next Tuesday wherever you're going to be. All we ever have is right now the present moment. We can try to capture the moment, but we were unable to. It's, it's, it's a blip to us. God is in all of our present moments, whether we acknowledge him or not. He doesn't require our acknowledgement to be there. As I've shared before, I'm convinced that this is what Jesus meant when he taught that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
within reach all around us, even here in our linear space-time, much like radio waves, microwaves, x-rays, here but not easy to point to. The voice of the shepherd is ever-present in every moment of our space-time experience. The sheep follow it, all the while still doing sheep things. It's not like they're following it, doing anything different. They're still doing sheep things. They're eating grass, basically, trying not to kill themselves accidentally. Um, Sorry, I got lost. Um, And the goats do not follow the voice of the shepherd. They're focused on their own things. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. I want us to think about the judgment of God today being broader than a one-time event in space-time. Don't get too nervous. I'm not suggesting there's not a final judgment. Many people, much smarter than me, can and will continue to argue about that for the rest of their lives. I suspect that it might look a little bit different than they think, but that doesn't matter for today. For today, I want us to consider that the main difference between the sheep and the goats is not what they did and did not do, but rather how or why they did or did not do it. I think the main difference between the sheep and the goats is their use of the now. After all, it is all they have, too. The voice of the shepherd is ever-present in every moment of our space-time experience. Sheep are tuned into the voice of the shepherd. Goats are tuned out. We ebb and flow between those states. We ebb tuned in. We flow tuned out. Sheep ebb to heaven. Goats float to hell. Flow to hell. As Peter has suggested in the past, I believe we are both sheep and goats. We are Jesus and Mises in our space time. We have sheep moments and we have goat moments. Sheep moments in which we follow the voice of the shepherd. Goat moments in which we don't hear the voice or simply do not follow it. Much like we can enter into the kingdom of heaven now at hand by following the voice of the shepherd, walking with the Father We can also enter into the absence of the Father now by walking without the Father. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. We aren't alone in this experience. I think we're in good company. As I was talking about this with Heather, she pointed out the hall of faith. I'm just going to point out, I think that's a really gross, cringeworthy thing to call it. But in Hebrews 11, there's a passage that is sometimes referred to as the Hall of Faith. So we're going to look at it today as the Hall of Faith, because I think it's like a Hall of Fame. It's filled with goats, the greatest of all time of our faith, right? These Hall of Faithers are typically described as sheep, but we're going to look at some questionable moments quickly, briefly. We're not going to get really deep into them. You can dig into these on your own if you really want to go down that road. But the greatest of all time, goats, that's what that stands for if you're not a sports fan. Um, They also had, they they are sheep, but they also had goat moments. So I'm just going to name a few. You probably know most of these folks. You're aware of their accomplishments. I don't need to elaborate on their accomplishments. Paul does, or whoever wrote Hebrews, does a very good job in chapter 11 uh, elaborating on those. Noah, great man of God, except that time when he passed out drunk in the vineyard, naked, face up. And his sons had to go clean that up. Uh, Sarah, wife of Abraham, great woman of faith. Uh, Her goat moment, probably her biggest recognizable goat moment, I would say has a name, Ishmael, right? She crafted the whole plan. (laughs) So that's that's a big one. Um, Abraham himself, the father of our faith, right? This guy is everybody's father. We all learned it in Sunday school. We all march, right? We're all Abraham's sons and daughters. Um, I mean, there's a long list of things I could have chosen from, but I'm going to go with this one. Uh, He lied twice to protect his own life instead of Sarah's. It's a horrible story. You can read it. I'm not going to read it to you. Isaac, Abraham's son, didn't fall too far from the tree. The same lie to protect his own life instead of Rebekah's. Jacob is named. Great man of faith. Very hard to find a goat moment for him, um, but deceived his father for his birthright. Moses, pretty well known, 
did some amazing things, really big sheep moments. Um, he also committed murder and had a really small, I think, goat moment that's a weird one that Peter, I know, has talked about a lot and is kind of hung up on, what? <laughs> Striking the rock out of anger, right? It's like, really? That you're not going to let me go into the promised land because of that? I've done all kinds of horrible things. But that was a goat moment. Striking the rock. It was a blatant disregard of God's voiced instruction to him. There are tons of people that didn't make the hall of faith uh, that are worth mentioning. A couple just offhand, Jonah and Saul. I think we all know Saul, Paul. Um, so I'm thankful for these tough passages in Scripture because I just think it's ever more proof. Well, I'll say it this way. I don't think those passages would exist if the Bible were simply written to manipulate people. I would leave that stuff out, right? There's enough there's enough good stuff, enough sheep stories we could focus on that we would leave those out. But the honesty of Scripture is refreshing to me. It's, it, is, uh, it should be refreshing to all of us, and that's kind of what I want to look at. So they're known for following the voice of God, these people, but all of them had their goat moments. How do these goats get into the kingdom of God? There's an author that I love. His name is Donald Miller. He's kind of moved out of authoring now, unfortunately, but has written some fantastic stuff. We're going to hear something from him a little bit later. But he has a great quote in a book that he wrote titled A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. He says, when you stop expecting people to be perfect, you can like them for who they are. And I feel like that's the case for these goats. Capital. Periods acronym. Um, the big question, what does God want me to do? What does God want from me? Ask this question a lot. I hear this question asked a lot. Um, Heather reminded me of a story. We don't have a lot of stories that are really fun to recall from <laughs> our early years because I was not a Christian and she was a Christian. So she was trying to share her faith one day in a restaurant with me. And if anyone's been with me for one of those conversations, you know how this probably is going to end. But um, I was pretty angry. I was angry because I wasn't hearing from God, right? What, why doesn't he speak up? What does he want from us? Why would he do this? Why would he put, roll this into motion? And I was getting more angry and more angry and yelling and, you know, looking to Heather to answer the questions that she didn't have answers to. And she said to me, God is right here right now. And I said, Great. If he's here right now, then why doesn't he tell me what does he want from me? What does he want? And Heather's eyes, I remember it very vividly to this day. Um, her eyes just started to well up and tears started to roll down her face. And, you know, I, my response was, of course, I just want this to stop. Just stop doing it. You know, just stop that. Stop. Just stop crying. This is ridiculous. But, um, but she describes the experience when she remembers it as her mouth was just locked shut, right? And tears were flowing. She remembers specifically not feeling sad, just tears flowing. And my Mises just wanted it to stop, right? Not out of care for her or concern for her, but out of care and concern for my comfort because we're in public, right? Don't cry. You, now I've made you cry. Now I'm the bad guy, right? That, and I was. <laughs> so, um, but it is a moment that has stuck with me, and I think it was a, a moment where I realized the simplicity of God being with us, and I realized the simplicity of what he's asking from us. But it's hard. We walked out of the restaurant and I immediately forgot, right? I probably forgot before we got up and paid the bill, to be honest. But my question to you this morning is, are you hearing and following the voice of the shepherd? I think the voice was in those tears for me. It was in the silence. It was in the quiet. It was in the pain that came through the tears that said, I, I'm not asking for much. <laughs> I just would like to be with you right? Um, I'd like to share life with you. I think what God wants from us is profoundly simple. I think that, I also think that we do it more often than we give ourselves credit for, 
but that's also kind of the point. I think he, he really wants two things. He wants us to graze the pasture in which he has us, and he wants us to follow his voice to the next pasture. I think it's important to point out here that I'm not a shepherd, and Peter is not the shepherd. I'm not the shepherd. Peter's not the shepherd. John's not the shepherd because we work in a church. I used to work in a church, and the pastor's famous tagline was every staff meeting we got together, and he was concerned about sheep stealing. There was sheep stealing going on, people stealing the flock, right? And I would think, do you honestly think it's your flock? <laughs> or I, I'm, you think you're the shepherd? It drove me nuts. We can tell you some things that you can do, but we can't tell you the things that the shepherd has for you to do. See, the voice of the shepherd is equivalent to the voice of Jesus. Jesus told us the whole of the law is summed up in two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. We can be pretty hard on ourselves. You ever been hard on yourself? Raise your hand if you've ever been hard on yourself. And if you didn't, congratulations. <laughs> That's impressive. I think you deserve a round of applause if you haven't been hard on yourself. We're hard on ourselves, but we're also very quick to let ourselves off the hook, right? I might see something in Brandon that I don't like too much, and I'm going to talk about how much I don't like it. Well, I'm probably guilty of the exact same thing, right? But I know my circumstances. I have an excuse. I know that it's permissible for me, but for Brandon, gross. You should stop doing it. <laughs> so we're often guilty of the same things. We refuse to give others, we refuse to give mercy or grace to others for. And I'm not saying we always are, but a lot of times we are, right? And we're quick to give ourselves that grace, right? Oh, well, I, you know, I was angry that I'm having a bad day, whatever, whatever the thing might be. Heather will ascribe most of my moments like that to, oh, well, he hasn't eaten, right? <laughs> so um, <laughs> they made sure I had a sandwich this morning. I thought that was cute. Bailey came back with my coffee and she said, oh, I got you a sandwich too. I said, that wasn't just on a whim. <laughs> that was planned. <laughs> but thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so Jesus, I want to look at him a little bit longer, right? He's a great thing to look at. Jesus didn't have a physical address. So just as a matter of fact, he simply did not have neighbors based on one, okay? He did have neighbors because he spent an immense amount of time traveling a very small region. So there were people that he encountered on a regular basis. But his neighbors were changing constantly. But he was present and genuinely engaged with his neighbors, regardless of their status in life. His voice is in the gospel. His voice in the gospels is generally not about being heard or being right. Jesus, I think somebody compiled a list of questions or a number of questions that Jesus asks in the four gospels, 339 questions. Does that sound like someone who's trying to make sure that when he leaves, it's all going to get documented correctly? No, it sounds like someone who's pretty curious, who's engaged, who's present. Graze the pasture in which he has you. Follow his voice to the next pasture. So I think instead of asking, well, what do I do? What do you want? What does he want from me? We should ask, what am I already doing? Am I already doing something Good, a sheep thing? We usually don't have to ask when we're doing a goat thing. Is there something else I'm feeling called to do? Our daughter Lily has been going through a struggle of just working through some stuff and been trapped in the house for a long time. She's getting out now, making great progress, and that's really great. But during that time, even during that time, like trapped at home, not leaving, She's been able to find things that she does now that bring us immense joy and that bring her joy. And that's been a cool process to watch. So there's no excuse. Um, even trapped <laughs> in a, a room by yourself, I guess, if you will, most of the time, you can still find something. 
What are the little things you're doing but don't take seriously? Are they already there? Remember, the sheep aren't aware of, of them when they are doing them. They aren't aware of the good things, right? They're asking, well, when do we do that? That's cool. All right, awesome. Uh, guess we're great. Um, but don't stay there too long because the trick is to not become proud of what you're doing. You can't make what you're doing your why. If you make what you're doing your why, you run into trouble. What does it look like to follow the voice of the shepherd? Well, I think a few things. Doing for others without concern of gain, for no good reason. Peter used to use a phrase at Lookout that I used to love, and it just stirred people up, but um, he would describe Jesus as good for nothing, right? Uh, just good. Because it, it's true, even though it sounds horrible, right? <laughs> it is true. He's just good for no good reason other than just goodness. Um, allow yourself to be part of the bigger picture without having to be the hero of the story. I went, Bailey's a huge Spider-Man fan. I don't care what you hear. This is not the greatest Spider-Man movie ever made that's out right now. It's a good one. It's not the greatest ever made. And there's too many heroes in it for me. I'm not a multiverse guy. Too many heroes. Too many heroes. It was still good. I recommend seeing it. But um, I don't know about that best one ever made stuff. So graze the pasture that you're in. We want to choose the pasture so many times. Graze the pasture that you're in with the shepherd. So Donald Miller was a writer in the Christian world for a while. I am getting old and this is really tiny, so you'll have to bear with me. But um, this is from his blog that has disappeared. It's gone now, unfortunately. <laughs> but he wrote some great books and he wrote some great stuff. And he was exploring where he was going to head next. This is quite a while ago, 2010. And he wrote this blog post. So I think it's an encouragement for me. I think it was a massive encouragement for Heather, and I think it'll be an encouragement for you as well. Last week, I had the privilege of talking with Max Lucado. Max Lucado, any people familiar with Max Lucado, right? Christian writer, written many, many, many great books. Um, I had the privilege of talking with Max Lucado. I was trying to make some career decisions and asked Max if I could run some things by him. That must be nice. <laughs> Um, he was waiting to get a root canal and for some reason was still willing and even happy to talk to me. I can't imagine. Nevertheless, we talked and I'm glad we did. One of the decisions I was in the midst of making regarding walking away was regarding walking away from a great career opportunity because it just didn't feel like it fit my personality. I felt like I needed to stay home and write books and not do a whole lot more. The opportunity was declining the opportunity I was declining was remarkable and it would offer me a larger platform. Max told me he'd made a similar decision years before to stop doing a radio show because even though it was a very good project, it just wasn't his sweet spot. He needed to stay home and write books. It would be hard to argue he made a bad business decision. Even though he's less, he's got, he's even though he's let go of perhaps many opportunities to expand his platform, he's remained focused on what God has gifted him to do, and he's sold more than 60 million books. When you sit down with Max, there's nothing about him that gives you the feeling that he's trying to get ahead. He's calm, he's at peace, and he's plowing his little field. Over the next 10 years, I'd like to write a book each year. That may change because I certainly can't control the future. Good managers, of, uh, but I'd really like to get a little plot of land going, and I know it takes time. There will be opportunities to plow a larger field, and some farmers have it in them to do so. They are good managers of people and technology and so forth, but to be honest, I'm not. I'm a good writer, or at least I hope to be someday. My sweet spot involves sitting down every day and getting a little something going on the typewriter. Typewriter? That's all I know how to do. I promise this came from the internet. The bigger field calls to me sometimes. I look at my peers and I get jealous. But if I tried to do what they did, I know I'd fail. I just can't manage it. God did not give me that story to tell. 
So my question to you is, what's your field and are you plowing it? Are you plowing too little? Are you plowing too much? What's your sweet spot? And in 10 years, will you have a small orchard that you can feed your family and some of your friends? What's your land to toil? What's your pasture to graze? And even though we don't know each other, I'm going to take a risk and answer some of these questions for you. If you have a family, if you are married with kids, that's a field to plow. If a larger field is calling you away from your family field, then you don't have it in you to plow it. So let it go. Your family comes first. Further the plot in that story. Get your wife some flowers. Go fishing with your kids. Plow the field God has given you. Andy Stanley says that in life, your family is going to suffer or your work is going to suffer, so choose. Your work life are those three rows of beans. The rest is your family. I think, and the work rows can't replace the family rows. I know it will feel like you're giving up something, and the truth is you are, but how do we really know what God may do with our faithfulness? The image I get in my head often when I think about Max Licato is the image of the boy with the bread and the fish. The boy had a small amount of food, but Jesus used it to lead thousands, to feed thousands. Sometimes I see Max tending a small patch of strawberry bushes. It's just a small plot of land, and he doesn't tend more, and he doesn't tend less because he has a family and a church, and well, a social life too. But God takes that little plot of strawberry bushes and feeds millions. Your job isn't to feed millions. It's to tend the land God has given you, no more, no less. If he wants to feed millions, he will. But that's no guarantee. We don't know what God will or won't do. Plow the field that God gave you. This is going to be a bit controversial, but I'm just going to say it. God gave you a heart and a wellspring of delight and desire. That heart can be corrupted for sure. But God also speaks to you through that heart. If you are given an amazing opportunity to become rich and famous, but you aren't looking forward to the work, ask yourself if God put a heart inside you to do that work. If not, let it go, no matter the cost. Now here I'm going to get really controversial. If you have an opportunity to build God's kingdom in some massive way, quotations around building, but the work is like pulling teeth, I think you have to really ask yourself, is that if that is what God is calling you to do. There are times, Jonah, when the problem isn't the work, it's you. But there are also times when the problem is the work itself, namely that the work just isn't for you. I firmly believe that God calls people into work, gives them a heart to do things that seem to have nothing to do with the kingdom. And furthermore, nobody will ever be able to figure out why it is God would have them do it. Except this, Nothing speaks more powerfully than a person who has been set free to do the work that he or she loves. There's some gospel truth in there somewhere. I like to look at it this way. I pray and ask God where the wind is blowing. If the wind is blowing in a Christian book and that that helps people's faith, I write that book. And if the wind is blowing on a novel that has nothing to do with faith at all, I write that book. And I'm free and I love it. And I thank God he gave me the work and let me do what I love. So plowing the field in front of you is equivalent to grazing in the pasture in which he has you. What does it look like to follow the voice of the shepherd? I think it looks somewhat like that living your life. Think about the things that you're doing on a daily basis that impact others that you may not be aware of. Don't think about them too long, but you could notice them (laughs) just to say, okay, I I, I have some sheep moments in there. (laughs) They're there. Um, What does ignoring the voice of the shepherd look like? Well, it's goat-like qualities. It's cluelessness. It's tuned out. It's stubbornness. I'm really, really down on goats. I apologize. I know people love to put them on their backs and do yoga, but I don't get that. Um, it's, I don't know how to mentality. I don't know how to do that. That's not, uh, surely God tapped the wrong shoulder. That's not my expertise. Um, or it's, I'm too uncomfortable with that type thinking, right? Uh, I could do that, but uh, it's going to be really hard. I don't want to. Excuses, self-focused. Self-focused. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying in this message 
that sin doesn't matter. I don't want anyone to hear that. Um, sin is missing the mark and it's going to happen and it happened to the best of the, the goats of our faith, right? The important thing to remember is to keep showing up. You can't change what happened yesterday. You can't guarantee what will happen tomorrow, but you can be present right now, right now. Sacrificial love is not the cause of a righteous new nature in us. It is the inevitable fruit of receiving a new nature. It can't be mapped out. Peter in the recent sermon said, you know, I want a map, not a presence. Well, you can't map it out. It's difficult to understand or believe, but that doesn't make it not real. The New Testament is consistently clear, and I believe the same story is told in the Old Testament, that the way that we love others has eternal significance. When we surrender to the shepherd, we are invited into that eternity right now. It surrounds and permeates our space-time. And we get to share in it. I don't think I gave myself this passage. So uh, it's very important to note that right after this, Jesus says in Matthew 26, I'll wait for that. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. He is the shepherd and he is the lamb. In Exodus, God explains that either a goat or a sheep may be used as a sacrificial animal. Either way, it shall be without blemish a male of the first year. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. In John 10, Jesus tells us, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. His work on that tree in that garden is a once for all work. It's a once for all event. It's one sacrifice for all time. It's more visible in that timeline that Peter provided for us to see how it permeates, how it flows. Separating the sheep from the goats, that event, the wheat from the chaff. Wheat goes to heaven, chaff goes to hell. Both are consumed by the same eternal fire. We are invited to participate in his kingdom on this side of our physical death, in this space-time, in our now. Don't let the fear of uncertainty about eternity take you off that task. Look into the eyes of Jesus. Know that you can trust God to sort that all out. If you don't know him, Don't try digging deeper into understanding him. Instead, put aside those distractions and sit with him, graze in the pasture. The thief that he warns against can work alone in goat moments or in what I call shepherdless herds. The voice of shepherdless herds are very dangerous to our psyches. And our world is full of them. They can be run by a wolf in sheep's clothing. They can be run by a sheep who found the shepherd's cloak and threw it on and said, hey guys, follow me. I'm officially lost, I apologize. But I think we'll just stay here at the foot of the cross and see the lamb and the shepherd together and surrender to him together. Because on the day that he was betrayed by one of those flocks, herds, shepherdless herds, He took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, having given thanks, he 
took the cup and said, this is my blood, pour it out for you. Drink it in remembrance of me. And I invite you all to come forward, tear off a piece of bread, dip it in the wine. The dark cups are wine, the blue cups are juice. They're both the blood of Christ and they're both the Lamb of God. See, I want to play piano again. Um, Well, church is about surrendering to the shepherd together. I got to read my notes or I'll talk forever. Um, And listening for his voice. Coming together to graze in the same pasture for a little bit. Coming together to surrender at his table and ingest his grace. We may follow together or he may have us in different pastures through the week. But we get to come together every once in a while and graze in the same pasture. And I'm thankful that you meet us here in the pasture, that we get to get together and have a good time. If you're having trouble hearing the shepherd's voice, talk with someone about it. Picnic on the patio, or I guess Community Connect extended because of the rain delay, is a great place to do that. <laughs> no, matter where you're, no matter where you're eating, lasagna in the lounge is a great place to talk about that with someone. Talk about the trouble you're having hearing the voice. It's okay. Other people have been there. Um, even if you're struggling with ignoring the voice, it's okay to talk about that too. It's best to talk about it. Or at any of the summer meetups that are coming up. This Wednesday, I'm going to meet John at the golf course and we're going to try frisbee golf. Am I good at throwing frisbees? No. Am I good at golf? No. Can I talk? Sure. I can do that. If you're interested in serving others alongside other sanctuarians and you don't know where to start, we are partnering with a ministry downtown called Christ's Body Ministries. And they have a wonderful ministry to the homeless. So we're going to start with something easy. If you're cleaning out your closets or you have some clothes that you think you don't want anymore, just bring them to us. And you can just bring them to the Connect Center. We'll have a place set up with a bin and some sort of sign that says, put your clothes here um, if we need that. But bring in your clothes. We're going to do this clothing drive all summer long. It'll go into the fall and through the fall probably. They're always, always looking for winter clothes. So the more the merrier on the winter clothes. Uh, You can bring new clothes also if you wanna buy socks to bring socks or something. Socks is need that they always have. Um, So that's an easy way to participate together in some giving. And we're also, I'm working on uh, organizing a trip to their facility in June for a small group of us who might be interested in just rolling some burritos for them. I think one day when I was there, they rolled 700 plus burritos. So there's a lot of need for burrito rolling. (laughs) So um, email me directly if you're interested in getting in on that first trip. We're probably going to make it a a regular thing, but I'd love for us to be able to pair folks up who are looking to do that. Uh, Maybe with somebody like, you know, I could go with Scott, we could finally get deeper than how's business? Oh, it's slow. Um, You know, (laughs) it's the conversation we have every week, I think, but we could spend some time together and get to know each other a little bit better. But May the shepherd guide you this week as you graze in the pasture in which he has you. And I also want to remind you that there's um, a table in the foyer for, um, for Vanessa's um, music and merch. And that song was beautiful. And I thank you for joining us today. It was really awesome to have you. Um, so don't miss that. And by way of benediction, I say to you, sheep, Go to heaven. Don't go to hell. In Jesus' name, be the gospel. Amen. Amen.